Um, I would love to, uh, firstly, uh, welcome our panellists this evening. It's wonderful that uh, all three of our panellists this evening are building new and interesting things in energy, either uh, in Kristen's case from within inside an organisation or in the case of um, uh, Matt and Greg from the ground up. Which is fabulous. So uh, uh, we've got Kristen Rahman, who's the Head of Strategy and Innovation at the Australian Gas Infrastructure Group. Um, Matt Stead, who's the CEO of Ping Services, that uh, we'll get into that in a moment. And Greg McGarvey, who's the Managing Director of the ACE EV Group. Um, rather than delve into each of you to introduce yourselves, I'm going to work along and uh, have a, a, a sort of a five minute chat with each of you and, and uh, go from there. I'm going to start with you, Matt. Ping. What is Ping? Do you want me to have a microphone? Like we are ah, going? yes, there's a system. Can you hear me? <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what is Ping? Um, so I'm an acoustic engineer. Who else is an acoustic engineer? No? Okay. Good. <laughs> 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 so you can say whatever you want now. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm safe. I'm safe. So basically, um, my whole life has been dealing with acoustics. Actually, not my whole life. Actually, no, my whole life. I've got years. Yeah. So we all, all got years. But um, through our consulting business, um, we've done a lot of wind farm work. And uh, a wind farm maintainer challenged us and said, you know what, my technicians can hear when there's blade damage on their turbines. So he said, my technici technicians can hear that, why can't you make a machine that will do that? Hmm. So that was sort of six years ago. Why did you take them up on this uh, bet? Uh, I like tech and I like starting new projects and building new things. Okay. Um, so I couldn't resist it. And where are you up to with Ping from uh, sort of dare? Where are you now? Yeah, so you really took, well, sorry, I'll go back. So at the six year mark ago, um, we did a lot of research. How much people are willing to pay? There's no point having a product that no one will pay for. Um, then how are we going to do it? You know, what's the technology we're going to use? And this is really around computers and communication and power to our devices. So where we're at now is we've really sort of accelerated, or well, we had to also prove to ourselves whether we could do it and whether it could be done. Um, and then so two years ago, we really accelerated what we've been doing. And so this is our current um, prototype. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, do you want me to talk through? Please, yes. Yeah, okay. yes. Um, Looks like it stabs things. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, so basically, there are six microphones on the bottom. These are the same as what you've got in your, mic in your mobile phone. So quite cost effective. Then we've got a processor here, which is you know, $10, $12, mm -hmm. um, which we put our fancy algorithms on. And then to finish it off, we are using satellite communication on top. So we talk to satellites, and then that goes back to our customer. So the whole... What is it? What is it? <laughs> it's a ping monitor, is the name we've given it. Okay. And um, so basically one of these, thank you, uh, one of these is located at the base of every wind turbine mm -hmm. and sits there continuously or semi-continuously listening for blade damage on the wind turbine. And that wind damage is just a, an anomaly in the in the sound, is it? Yeah, yeah. So it makes um, turns what it is, but say a lightning strike. Mm -hmm. um, so these blades are made of fiberglass. Um, they tend to get, well, they can get struck with lightning, um, and then that sort of tends to blow them apart a bit, and it'll make a fairly nasty whistling mm -hmm. sound as as the blade comes around. And have you got these in the field? Are these working now? Yeah, so we've got um, 30 of these in Victoria, mm -hmm. and then we did something with perhaps not such a good idea. We decided to, or we've got 30 of them installed in West Virginia. <laughs> How did that come to be? <laughs> <laughs> so something really local, something really convenient and handy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah um, basically, um, uh, one of our customers, one of the customers we're working with, has a nasty site. Which I can't tell you the side, sorry. <laughs> so there's a lot of secrecy in the wind business. Right. Non-disclosure agreements. 
And what's the business model? Do you sell these or are you providing a service? How does that work? Yeah, so um, our intention is to get the cost of these to a point where we can just roll into a, a sort of daily, monthly, yearly service. So we just sort of have these things sitting there, listening away, and then telling our customers when there's, when there's something wrong with their wind turbine. Oh, so, fabulous. And the whole point is so that, that when they know there's something wrong, they can repair it. Mm. Um, so I think, I can't remember who I was talking to, but it's like a crack on the windscreen of your car. If you've got a small little crack, if you repair it quickly, it's cheap. If you let it go, you might have to replace the whole windscreen. Yeah. I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kristen, on that point, I might jump over to you. Um, there is no more popular topic, I think, in, uh, in, in energy at the moment than, than hydrogen. Um, what is the project that, that you've been working on? Yeah, sure, and, and that is actually great great news from us uh, from our perspective because Australian Gas Infrastructure Group, most of the time when I talk to people, I first have to explain <laughs> what we are, who, what we do, uh, who we are, how it all works, and so and then I have to get on to hydrogen, which is a step above, and, and we've been looking at this uh, for years, um, and so it's really nice that we're getting some traction now, but what we're actually doing is we'll be uh, developing a, a a project known as Hydrogen Park South Australia. It will be an Australian first project uh, down here at Tonsley where we'll produce renewable hydrogen using electricity and water and we'll blend that at volumes of uh, no more than 5% with the natural gas and supply that to 700 customers in Mitchell Park. So as a business, we own the entire gas distribution network in, in South Australia and we'll sectionalise the part of the network to get this green gas blend. Is, is this a serious deviation for your business? I mean, you I would associate you not with generation, but with yeah. distribution. Yeah, I mean, well, we're a gas infrastructure business and, and that's what we do. We manage gas assets safely and reliably. Um, producing hydrogen is another piece of gas infrastructure mm -hmm. and the infrastructure to get it for customers remains the same. So it is in that as a business, we don't produce things historically, but in terms of actually what it means for the, the staff, we still manage gas infrastructure and that's what this is. And what's the motivation for your business to go like, let's let's get into hydrogen, let's get this mixed in with the, the traditional sources? Yeah, and we were looking at it uh, for a while, but really it's to do with what's your vision. You know, and stakeholders mm -hmm. would come to us and ask us that very question, you know, where do you see yourselves in 2050? I understand that electricity has a role to play in the zero carbon world. What is your your role to play? Um, and hydrogen and biomethane are zero carbon fuels and blending them is something that, that's being looked at. Certainly biomethane is blended with gas and injected into the gas networks a lot overseas, um, facilitated by policy that's really helped that get in there, much like we have policy that help the renewable electricity um, businesses get off the mark here in, in Australia. So really for us, it was about underpinning our investment. So we've got $8 billion worth of gas assets in Australia, and we recover the cost for those over 60 years. These assets have really long lives and customers are paying for them now. So how do we make sure that we are demonstrating and that we have a role to play in the zero carbon world and that's been one of our uh, main drivers really so protecting the relevance of your core asset in a way and making sure that it's still um, part of a zero carbon environment De definitely about protecting our assets but i think you speak to customers and they say look for most of them I'm really interested in low carbon, but I don't want to pay a cent more for it than I have to. Like, uh, please do it for me cheaper. I'm, I'm hurting enough as it is. And if you put all your eggs in the renewable electricity basket, that means that all the energy that is supplied through the gas networks, and that's a lot. So 44% of Australia's energy comes from gas. In Victoria, two thirds of the household energy is supplied by gas through the pipelines and only one third through electricity. In South Australia, it's a bit more even because we're not as cold, uh, but gas actually plays a really important part in people's lives. Uh, they just don't realise it because we're pretty reliable and, and their assets are underground. So it's not as front of mind. And there's also transport. 
So the decarbonisation challenge is to decarbonise all of that. That's a really huge challenge. If you say, I'm going to do that only through electricity, that's going to mean you need significant investment in electricity assets, in storage, in things like that. And you do need renewable electricity. It's really important. Batteries are really important, but you need something else as well. So yes, we were, our driver was underpinning our assets, but we think it also has a lot of relevance for the customer. We have reliable energy supply. That's what the gas networks do. We can use infrastructure that already exists to make sure that we're delivering decarbonisation at the lowest possible cost to our customers. Where are you up to? How how far away from this being a yeah, it, it, part I mean, of the it, mix? It's real. So we, the electrolyzer is under construction for our demonstration project here right now in Germany. Other parts of the project are being manufactured here in Adelaide. We've received our development approval. We'll start construction. You can see the side out the window. There's nothing there now, it's just oh. dirt, so take the word for it. Uh, yeah. It's magnificent. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just imagination. Um, I can imagine yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very simple. Uh, so uh, construction will kick off next month. So if, only, if this was next month, I would actually be able to point out, I mean, it's probably still in a temporary fence, um, and we'll start blending mid next year. Beyond that, we're already looking at the next projects. Um, you, you might all be aware of uh, Dr. Alan Finkel's National Hydrogen Strategy. Um, there's other funding rounds, ARENA. Um, so we're really looking to do the next big thing. So we're not going to do the same project again. It will be more about extending, taking the learning from what we've just delivered and making it, doing more with it. I mean, hydrogen is as clean as the source of the energy that is inputted into creating it. Where, where have you got a, a, a roadmap to where that power comes from? Yeah, that's a really good question. For the facility here, we're connecting to the grid, but we're purchasing the, the LDC. So it will be renewable electricity we use. And it's actually really important in terms of project learnings for us to connect to the grid. So South Australia's done really well with renewable electricity, but that can have network issues when we've got too much solar in the middle of the day and electrolyzers can respond in you know six or so seconds which means that we're able to provide a service to the electricity network at points when they have too much solar in the middle of the day so you know I used to work at AEMO and I've spoken to people there when we're getting to a point of too much solar people are talking about things like resistor beds which is essentially you know wasting energy we can use that we can turn on the electrolyzer really quickly and turn this into another mm -hmm. renewable, uh, renewable energy source. So it's really important to get the learnings from connecting to the grid and we're getting the certificates to ensure that the, the hydrogen we use is, is green. Uh, going forward, it's about where does it make sense to put it. So South Australia is a great place for renewable energy. We've got a lot of curtailed wind. We can mm. access that to make the economics Better. We can also facilitate new renewable energy projects. So the best way to produce hydrogen is to co-locate wind and solar and potentially even batteries so you get more of a steady, steady load. So we'll be working with other people in the, the chat energy value chain to find the optimal spots to put these where we can get the best utilisation. Hmm. Fabulous. And why Tonsley Park? Is there a rational rationale for that? Well, we, we all can see the innovation and the sort of people that are attracted down here. Um, it, it, so it made sense. Yeah. Just the culture and the environment around here has been um, really fantastic and, and, and we're really pleased to be located here. Siemens are also providing our electrolyzer and they've obviously got operations here as well. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to be part of the Chonsley community. Cool. Sounds like you've used that line. I haven't. Did you, did you like it? Use it again. Oh, yeah. Did you get that one on the video? <laughs> Greg, um, lucky last, and you brought the best toy. Sorry. I mean, it's cool, but this is. No, 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 it's a toy, and it's sitting downstairs, but uh, you'll probably want me to justify why we've gone into EV. So I've got a question for everyone here. I haven't even asked a question. Listen carefully. <laughs> so You're listen. asking them questions. Yeah, well, no. well, they're important. And um, <laughs> the question is this How many of you would like to sleep less, drink more, and have less sex? Just put your hand up. <laughs> okay. That is the reason why we're building EVs. 
And, and that sure. wraps up today's <laughs> session. So. Because if you drive an EV, all that's reversed. You sleep better. Um, oh. drink, <laughs> drink less. And plenty of sex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now for my question. <laughs> Keep the microphone. <laughs> I did not have to follow that. No, I had no idea. Um, it seems to me that they, in terms of EVs, yes. out of California, we've got Tesla being all cool and, and, and sexy, and we've got China really ramping up volume on the EV as much as anything for local demand. Right. Where can Australia fit in the EV market? Where's the sweet spot for us? Well, that's a great question, Piers. Thank you, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, the proof of it is that we're here. We've been working on this for four years and everyone said to me, including Piers, don't bloody tell them you're a marine biologist. Well, I am a marine biologist and my don't business tell partner them that. <laughs> Is, is an economist and a journalist. And the approach we've taken with the EV is it's more like a mobile phone with seats, and it comes just comes equipped with seats and wheels. And what we can do with this EV, we can move people around, we can move goods around, but importantly, what we can do is move energy around. And we can bring new energy security to each person that owns an EV. Classic, California, and one of our partners out of Silicon Valley, in the energy management sector, and I'll talk a little bit more la later about the energy mesh. But one of our partners out of uh, Silicon Valley said, Greg, the issue here in California is the power companies have to turn our energy off yeah. when it's windy mm -hmm. and hot. Mm -hmm. Now you imagine 888,000 homes without power. Do you think that's a political problem for those politicians? Mm -hmm. And so, um, the reality is that they're going to have to very quickly come to a solution and the solution really is your mobile battery on wheels because you can run your household off that battery if you're greedy, maybe two or three days, but if you're a little bit careful, up to five days. Yeah. So there's a big advantage with it. And um, the question which I, I skirt around questions, you can see that is saying, yeah. why are we doing it in Australia? The reason we're doing it in Australia, we were introduced to um, Dr. Charles Kung. He's here tomorrow. We just picked him up today. Very clever nuclear engineer. And he partnered with a gentleman called Gerhard Kerr out of Germany. And they designed an EV from the ground up. They didn't copy anything else. They started with their own plan. And what they've done is design an EV that takes one third the energy to build, very light, it's made out of equipped out of materials that can be repaired easily and recycled easily. And um, we were fortunate to meet him. We're developing a solar farm as well at the moment. And the marine biologist bit is, if you probably understand, the sea is the most important part of our globe. And I'm doing this more of a, as a vocation. I hope I'll make some money out of it, but the car industry is atrocious for making money, but I think we can do something with it. But um, our EV is very clever. And um, it comes, uh, the first one, when you go downstairs, you'll see that vehicle down there came in six boxes. And we brought in a mechanic from Germany. And then we realized it didn't speak English, so that got a bit difficult. We got a local mechanic that spoke English and German. In six days, they took all the bits out of the boxes. And we've got Mark Haig here. Look at Mark, he's a hero in South Australia. He's taking on the assembly and building of these vehicles. He's probably thinking, what a stupid idea, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and they built that over six days. And on the seventh day, a little bit biblical, but on the seventh day, uh, Ollie got in the car and drove it out of the workshop in Brisbane. Mobile phone and videoed it, second, 17 second video, whacked it up on LinkedIn, and had 21,000 views over five days. And so I thought, Greg, I think you're onto something. And we believe we're onto something that's really good for Australia, really good for new career options, and great for our grandchildren. Because I'll, I'll probably talk too long. No, no. I'm not I was, gonna, I was just going to ask for a little bit of detail. <laughs> if, if, if people didn't actually stop and look at the vehicle, can you just tell them what this vehicle is, what, who it services? Yeah, uh, we've taken a specific market. We're looking at light, light commercial and last mile delivery. Our vehicle's meant to run around all day, 
you know, 60 to 80 kilometres an hour. Uh, we've got four models. The one downstairs you'll see is the first one coming out. Then we've got a ute, uh, an urban, a little run around four, five seater car, and then a sports car. But we're targeting, um, we're not a Tesla, we don't pretend to be, but we've got some very clever smarts in our vehicle. We've got a group in Melbourne doing the ecosystem for it. Um, and our car is all plastic. It's glued together. And like, people get pretty shaky about a car that's glued together, so we'd really say it's chemically welded, and it's the same as a bone. <laughs> 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 in fact, jungle glue. <laughs> It's not the clag bulb. Yeah. And it's um, the chemical welding, uh, it's actually better than a normal steel weld in terms of uh, fatigue and everything else. Uh, and our vehicle, the skeleton, is common to all the vehicles, made of 14 bones. Uh, they're a carbon fibre composite and um, they're designed to last 15, 20 years. If you get sick of the look of the vehicle, you change the skins. Now, tonight, tonight here, tonight we've got also Nazim and Mike from UQ, they're doing some clever research for us in the green plastics area because we want our car to be green so we're going to be using hemp as a nanoparticle filler and I'm probably using the wrong terminology but Nassim can correct me and bioresins for the panels. You mentioned that the first one of these came out of Brisbane. Correct. How did you find yourself here? Well. I live in Harvey Bay. I don't know if many of you know Harvey Bay in Queensland, Fraser Island area. It's a great spot. I've got nine grandchildren there, my four children. Okay, so we see why you moved. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we tried very hard in Queensland to convince them that we had something that was very good. Couldn't convince them. And I think part of the problem is that the government, and it's the same here in every sector, not obviously, but it's driven by the fossil fuel industry and the fossil fuel model. And what we're doing will destroy that business model. And they're not prepared to change because that change will bring some great new opportunities with you know, just different ways of doing things. And uh, so at the start, it was just me talking like I am now, and I had a few banners, and I arrived here in Adelaide to a Smart Cities event two or three, a couple of years ago. And along came a, a South Australian uh, bureaucrat and came out and said, hey, what are you doing? I said, I told him, he said, how can we help? And honestly, I've never heard that from a government person before. Pay <laughs> 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 your taxes on time. And, <laughs> and he was a bloody good help. He introduced us to Mark at Eldon, you know, and it was just, as, just things as simple as that, you know, help just assisting. And to be honest, today, very first concrete letter from the South Australian government said they were interested in us being here. We had nothing else. And uh, anyway, the Premier wrote a letter and said, Greg, please stay in South Australia. <laughs> please find checking clothes. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> well, I guess that um, I've got a question that either Matt or, or, or Greg can jump on, which is finding these early customers. I mean, you went to West Virginia for a customer. How have you gone finding customers, and, and what's that what's that experience been like, <laughs> either of you? you want to talk first? Um, I don't know, I always like to make life hard for myself. So my first customer was in Denmark. So, if you, so actually, our Danish customer is organising a pilot in West Virginia. Oh, good. Which is getting more obscure. But yeah. I, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what you people think, but... And with LinkedIn and so forth, I just reached out to the lead blade guy in his company and he responded. So I think if you've got a good product and people are interested, they'll engage. So you know, there's a, we've gone fishing for customers and a lot of them haven't really bitten our bait. But you know, if people are serious about innovation and serious about doing things differently, they'll, they'll respond. Right. And how do you convince somebody to buy a plastic vehicle held together with Tarzan glue? Well, we don't talk about it like that from the start. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work for you. Um, versus going in and just kind of replacing the vehicle with the next. Well, on I the think line. The, the easiest tactic, really, and it's not that's no, no difficult to do, is that you look at the hip pocket. And if you own an EV, particularly our EV, 
and it'll do, it'll cost you $36 to drive a thousand kilometres. If you go to your petrol station and see what you get out of that for a Bowser for $36, it'll get you anywhere. The other great thing about it is that it doesn't steal oxygen, it doesn't pollute the air, and it doesn't need massive maintenance schedule to keep it going. Um, you know, we did our first service on the, our cargo, took it to Bob Jane, had the wheels aligned. That's it. Hmm. And are people interested in the values piece, or is it just a dollar for dollar match? No, people do. There, there are. Well, we're fortunate at the moment. There's a, there's a, there's an unsupplied hunger for EV. Mm -hmm. We know that because we did a survey of our um, subscription list. And by the way, if you want to be on the subscription list and learn about what we're doing, you can jump yourself off any time. But just go to www. ACE, which stands for Australian Clean Energy, hyphen EV for electric vehicle dot com dot au. And you'll get a, you'll be updated. We did a survey. Now we know how he does his sales. <laughs> <laughs> and we did the survey of the list, and it was interesting because I, 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 I've been punching air a bit and wasn't too sure if we're on the right track. And that survey, uh, I said, okay, how many people will be buying a vehicle, an EV, in the next three years? Eighty-eight percent said they intended to buy an EV in the next three years. And I wanted to know, well, let's have a look at the business model, how we're we going to sell the vehicle. Because we were convinced that Tesla's probably got one of the better models. So we gave them the option of buy online, buy from a dealer, buy online with a test drive. 77% of the respondents said they don't want to buy off a dealer. So if you're a car dealer, you've got to start looking at a different business model. And um, of the other 77%, half wanted a test drive. Others were quite happy to buy the vehicle and know that if they drove it for a thousand kilometres and they weren't happy with it, they can hand it back. And we know, if you know, any of you have driven an electric vehicle, you know it's a joy compared to a normal car. So we're in pretty safe territory. It is fascinating the way the change of a drivetrain is changing the entire dynamics of an industry from the sales process through to the maintenance to the cost of ownership and also the, the length of ownership. Do you have a sense of how long people should be able to well, have one of these in their fleet? Well, I would like people to own these vehicles a minimum of 10 years. Yeah. Because what comes with our vehicle, it's like your mobile phone, it will automatically update. And when we come to a point where autonomy is really well proven and cheaper than it is at the moment, we'll be able to plug the autonomy into our vehicle because at the end of the day, it's really electronics and software mm -hmm. and a little bit of technology. And um, we look at our vehicle, as I said, mobile phone on wheels. <coughs> it'll sit in the, in the shed update overnight. It'll send you a signal. We've got uh, very clever analytics in our battery uh, because what we're doing with our vehicles, we're selling the battery first. And batteries in electric vehicles have to meet some pretty stringent safety guidelines, drop tests, um, explosion proof, fire proof. So we're selling those domestic home battery first <coughs> because the vehicle won't come with the battery until probably 12 months till delivery toward the end of next year. And then you take the delivery of a vehicle, it's a 10 minute process, put the battery in the vehicle. So your home battery now has wheels and that means you can take that battery anywhere with the other energy mesh that we're designing around the vehicle. You just imagine say a thousand, 10,000 electric vehicles in the mesh connected, grid operator on the supply side identifies a peak in the mesh, it will automatically self-heal. It will trigger batteries. You have control of your vehicle. You know, so you might have your battery set to say, I will not share any energy if my battery is only 50%. And you can control that. And that self-heals, drops that grid, <coughs> or if there's a, an outage somewhere, and then you uh, getting the solution. It's not going to be there tomorrow, but it will happen in the next year or two. I want to go in a slightly different direction and look at it from, I guess, the, the almost the craven view that government takes of early stage businesses like yours. They look at you and go, job creation, investment attraction. And that's, that's the, the real appeal. But each of your businesses are in quite different segments. What's the flip side of that relationship? It's pretty clear what government wants from you. <coughs> What do you need from government to 
to scale these businesses as quickly as possible. Don't just say money. Uh, we don't. We don't need money. Good. It'd be good if they handed us some, but we don't need it. <laughs> we we're actually in a round two of a funding raise at the moment, and it's a humanitarian fund. And the two key goals of that humanitarian fund are job creation here and overseas, and reduction of carbon footprint rapidly. So we quite, we we tick those boxes. But round two is quite difficult. We're talking big dollars, and um, uh, all we want from government is open door saying look how can we help instead of putting barriers up with bureaucracy uh, like the energy mesh is a good example we're talking with key retailers here and overseas and AEMO we're talking with as well AEMO is actually getting it is a bit ahead of the game it's actually treating every individual in the future as a generation point so um, but there's still a, a, these linking there's some Set thinking there that we need to change. So we need government to be flexible to adopt that change and move ahead. Kristen, can I bring you in? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> look, we are, are very fortunate in that our Hydrogen Park South Australia facility was underpinned by a 4.9 million grant through the uh, Renewable Technology Fund that the South Australian government put forward. Um, and we are also in a fortunate spot that hydrogen is seen as a key future fuel across government. So, uh, as I said, we're there's a, the development of the National Hydrogen Strategy that Australia's chief scientist is leading at the moment that had COAG endorsement to move forward. There's funding rounds that various state governments are doing and ARENA is also supportive. And that's been uh, consistent despite changes of government, even here in South Australia. And we're very grateful to the support that it's got. And certainly that has helped um, when ideally I think that clear policy direction would help a lot from an environmental standpoint I mean what we've got now uh, sort of non-binding yeah you know we're targeting carbon neutrality by 2050 lots of states are targeting that but there's been a lot of focus only on electricity not so much on the transport sector in terms of, of targets um, and, and certainly mapping on gas. Um, and that really helps to get a lot of the market started. It helps from our perspective, we don't buy or sell gas generally. That's the job of the retailers. The retailers at the moment are not incentivized to buy green gas. Certainly some customers come up to them and say, we want to buy green gas, but not there's not that drive there at the moment. So for us, it's very difficult to get <coughs> all parts of the value chain aligned and, and pulling in the same direction, which is why we moved into a production space rather than just owning you know, pipes as we had done. Um, and so whilst the, the funding support has been really important, policy direction to all parts of the value chain would really help to, to drive the market further, I think. Do you think you're going to see that, or is it going to be industry-led for a while yet? I, I think at the moment, uh, look, I know we work on the National Hydrogen Strategy as well, and certainly it's something that's being discussed as part of that. Not a hydrogen, but a renewable gas more generally, which I think is really important. And we've got to remember that, uh, as I said before, a lot of the time on the electricity side, there has been these, you know, uh, the rep targets and, and battery schemes and things to help get them up that scale so that then the cost reductions really occur. Um, I'd like to see something similar to assist with the renewable gas. So it's not just hydrogen, it's biogas as well. We're looking at things like that and that has a really nice circular economy story um, that goes with it and jobs and growth, um, as you mentioned before. Uh, I don't know that any government would do anything that isn't directed to uh, put down, push energy prices down at the moment, but I think not doing anything for the gas side will have the unintended consequences of pushing prices up. So if you do not do anything to incentivise renewable gas and you say the only way to decarbonise is through renewable electricity, you are putting more pressure on the electricity side of things, on the electricity networks. And yes, they can do a lot of smart stuff with batteries and pumped hydro and time of use, so using things more at night. But if you try and put all the energy that's supplied by gas on the electricity network and all the energy that's required by transport on the electricity in network, 
there is no question that there is a significant amount of investment that will be needed in poles and wires and batteries and storage that will outweigh the investment that is in hydrogen. And you will at the same time increase the prices on gas networks as we recover our capital from a lower number of, of customers or a lower amount of demand. So doing nothing will have the unintended consequences of pushing prices up for electricity and gas. So it's a really tricky situation to be in. They don't want to push prices mm. up by saying, you know, incentivising or putting a policy setting on it, but at the same time doing nothing could have that very, very impact for both gas and electricity. Mm. Thank you. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, but we'll keep keep going no matter the, the policy setting, I think. Good. Uh, Matt, is there anything government can do for you? Yeah, I've been sort of thinking about this, and thanks for the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's probably two angles. Um, we're not going to sell the government. You know, this is an operational phase of a wind farm product. Yep. So we're going to sell to you know, listed or private companies. Um, I mean, so then I was thinking, well, what's government? Actually, the government's been pretty terrible about policy for green mm. energy in Australia. So they have more wind farms. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... The, yeah, I mean, the whole policy setting for so long has just been terrible. Um, so they've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, but in some ways, um, for wind farms, you don't necessarily need government policy anymore. No. Um, who, who, yeah, there's a stat I read the other day. There was more wind energy in Texas than coal energy recently. Who would have thought that? If you want to build a new power station or whatever, wind and solar are the way to go. You don't need the government to have policy. Mm. So I think in some ways the industry's moved on. So you, for you, it's, it's, it's essentially the market that Yeah, the market is driving it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, obviously we're a startup business and uh, I have to be complimentary about the state government and what they're doing around the innovation, I think what the universities are doing. It's so disingenuous <laughs> when you put that. <laughs> I need to be complimentary. You didn't do the I'm not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but you know, I think there has been a lot of positive energy around sport mm. in South Australia and Australia. So, I mean, we've received some government grants. Um, it's been very helpful. So I'm positive in that, that side. <laughs> um, I, I want to open it up to the floor, but just uh, to, to kind of wrap up that discussion, um, can each of you tell me where your businesses will be 12 months from? You know, I would hate to steal more time from you, Matt. Give him preparation <laughs> time. I need the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in 12 months' time, I'd like to... We have a 1,000 of these units around the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd like to have tied down some pretty major OEM customers. Mm -hmm. um, that process is taking so long. It would take a long time. I'd like to have that better down. And then I'd like to also be in our next industries as well. So we're going to move to other sectors beyond wind. Uh, like, um, you know, we've got a whole range of applications. I'd like to be in them. And then ticking along nicely. Cool. Kristen, beyond the fence? Oh, yes, we will have more than a temporary fence. I think 12 months' time, we will be producing renewable hydrogen and blending it into the gas network. Uh, there will be a national hydrogen strategy in place that we will be implementing. Uh, we will hopefully be supplying industrial customers with renewable hydrogen from the facility here in Tonsley as well, because we're also looking at the tube and trailer aspect, which also enables refueling. Um, so we hope to have those project expansions up and running. We've also got a proposal for an Australian hydrogen centre that looks at the feasibility about exactly how you'd roll it out to places like South Australia and Victoria, um, hopefully that, that's something that will be announced. Fabulous. And Greg, you look like I, you didn't get enough uh, on the government. Is there something you want to add there before? <laughs> oh, well, look, I'm not terribly worried what I say about the government because it doesn't make any difference. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we've just got to push on. But where we'd like to be in 12 months, and I'm sure Mark would too, is rolling out the first 100 vehicles here in South Australia. Um, and um, taking orders in for 600 the following year, working our way up to 21,000 by uh, 2025, and exporting quite a lot of them. We've had a lot of export inquiries. Um, 
which just opposed what we're trying to do in Australia. In Australia, the only reason, part of the reason we're in Australia is that, believe it or not, anything branded with an Australian brand gets a 20 or 30% premium in uh, target countries in Asia and uh, overseas. So uh, that's the helpful bit. Mm. Very good. I have no use for it. <laughs> sure. um, I would love to open up to a broader discussion from the room if anyone has some questions. Sir? Can I just add off about the hydrogen? I'm intrigued to know hydrogen forms a very strong bond. You're trying to break that bond with whatever you're trying to get it from, mm -hmm. you know, methane or whatever water. I mean, it's energy in and energy out. So how are you going to get a saving in terms of what it costs you to break it and then reuse it? Well, I think the question there is about, you know, how does it become energy efficient in terms of, of cost? And the cost the cost savings are really around the amount of energy that you, you store in, in gas. So we can get uh, the economics to work and for it to make sense by uh, co-locating with wind and electricity and getting the prices down there. In terms of the total cost proposition, you've got to remember that it's not just like you, for electricity production, you need to build the generation, you would need storage. If you were to replace the energy supplied by gas, you need a lot of that. You need a lot of storage because gas supply is the peaky demand. You would need poles and wires and you would need to replace appliances in the home from gas to electric. So in terms of the cost benefit, it really is around the storage that you'd need to put in to supply, supply that peaky load that gas supplies, um, and also around the additional infrastructure you'd need to supply the additional load that, that gas. So it's more about the alternative uh, than about, yes, using electricity directly rather than going energy in, energy out, and then converting it back again. You're never going to get the same economics. But if you're trying to replace the market, the other infrastructure that you'd need to meet that same demand pushes the costs up. And you can also access the curtailed wind and the other aspects of it. So there's lots of things that you can do that make economic sense. The modelling we've shown is that in Victoria, if you were to use electrolysis to make hydrogen, and to put that into the gas network uh, compared to converting that gas network demand to electricity, it would be 40% cheaper for the customer to do the hydrogen than it would be to put in all the storage you'd need and the new electricity infrastructure to replace it with electricity. So then I'm envisaging pressurising the hydrogen and using it as vehicles, trucks and... Look, that's an option. So our Hydrogen Park South Australia facility um, we're hoping to announce soon that we'll also have the tube and trailer refit fueling, and that's to supply industry, um, and that can also enable supply to refueling stations. Right now, we can produce hydrogen uh, for a cost that's competitive with diesel, and it's probably most suited to the heavier vehicles. So it's essentially a fuel cell vehicle is essentially an electric vehicle, but you um, have the hydrogen as the input. To, to generate the electricity. It refuels in about a passenger vehicle, refuels similar to how your, your car refuels, so a few minutes, um, and they've got a, a really long range. So it's certainly something we're considering. Uh, the, the vehicle thing just takes a bit longer because you also have to have the refueling infrastructure as well as the vehicles. So vehicles are there, we're producing the hydrogen, you've just got to get the refueling stations up. I have another question. Um, at the moment, at home, they've got you know, several natural gas appliances. Mm -hmm. Can they run on hydrogen? Yeah, so uh, our appliances today are made to run on natural gas, and they run really efficiently on natural gas. All the theory says that you could blend up to 20%. We're doing work right now through the Future Fuels Cooperative Research Centre just to test that. Um, and certainly gas uh, is already tested. I think the limit gas is about 15% hydrogen. So the appliances you have in your home are already tested with some portion of hydrogen. Beyond that, it's really to do with the, the flame height and the flame speed. So it's not a technological challenge. We have a hydrogen barbecue that we roll out to events day that runs on 100% hydrogen. When we were on Towns Gas, that was 50 to 60% hydrogen and some places around the world still use Towns Gas today. 
Um, it's just about changing the burner in that appliance to get up to 100%. So just like if you've got a barbecue and you've got that plumbed into natural gas, someone will come out and change your burner over. It would be a similar approach that was needed at the moment to get to 100% hydrogen. So in terms of a full rollout, you might do 5, 10, 20% and then go to 100%. Or by the time we get there, there's certainly a lot of innovation going on. Who knows, we could get hydrogen burners put in, uh, or burners put in appliances now that could run on dual fuels a lot easier to interchange so that when the time comes to roll out, you could do either higher percentages or the changeover would not be as um, challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot of, uh, you know, I suppose from the Chief, Who wants it? Greg. Greg. Uh, I think some decent policy would be good because the, everyone's screaming out for it. I mean, we've got claims of climate emergencies, and, um, and it's not such a silly claim because I know from the, the sea point of view that there's a lot of locked in carbon, carbon dioxide sitting in the oceans, and only needs an elevation of a few, few degrees that's released into the atmosphere, and that'll have its own set of con consequences. And it could very easily tip us over and lead to runaway climate change. And the climate change is nothing more than nature responding to what we've been doing. And nature, at the end of the day, is preserving itself. They're not too worried about us. As a human species, we've been here a million years, maybe, at that. And um, no, the Earth will keep going. What's at, 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 what's, uh, at risk here is humanity, nothing else. But government needs to lead the way and with some sensible policies. Listen to the science and just step by step. The policies that change the way behaviour happens. And if the policies are there, it just makes it easier for people like us to produce the product that's going to help it. Why look at my vehicle as a solution? You know, it's my, it's my, my method of trying to do something with climate change because vehicle pollution is about 29% of the carbon load in the world. And it's not the carbon load that's the problem. We've got Asian countries wanting our vehicle, and they want it to go electric, not just with ours, with any vehicle, because of the air pollution problems they have in their cities, the health problems. Thank you. <laughs> a follow up to your um, point about your battery being a home battery first and then a, a vehicle mobility solution second. Sure. Um, would that battery be eligible for the state battery scheme? That's probably tied into that question there. And we're, we're having discussions at the moment with South Australian government because logically it should, because our battery is actually safer than the traditional house battery sitting there because it has to be fitted to a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And we've got monitoring analytics in the battery that mean we can live watch the temperature of the battery and the state. And we need that to manage the warranty on our battery. And there's, some, there's just some very clever analytics and management systems that are built into what we're doing. Yeah. Any other questions? So, uh, well, I, I come from New Zealand and we're, we're probably more in line with converting to electric cars in Australia as a lot more, and a lot more government support. We've been government. Yeah. Throughout the world, governments are going to insist France, Germany, by 2030, no more petrol cars allowed. So Australia's got to get its act together because it's going gonna, it's gonna to come. And, um, you know, you've got a great opportunity here to actually make your batteries because the biggest cost of the whole car is the actual battery, battery manufacturer. And if you could bring that down here in Australia, you've got an export industry that would beat the world. If you could use the research that this place could do and combine with Western Australia's... All that industry, but we've got really a blank check and we've got so many clever people out there that want to be supply chain, you know, in, in this region. And those skills, we wait another generation, they're gone. But we can pick them up now and really make this place hunt. By letting something die, something new will grow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have a last question? Yes. My question is for Matt. Um, when you said that you were expanding into using the acoustics um, testing and listening in other industries, will you stay aligned with renewables or 
that kind of industry or are you kind of going wider than that? No, much broader. I mean, we've all got eyes and ears. <laughs> yeah, so there are a lot of uses for analysis of sound. I mean, um, so we've been evaluating what those are and probably the first one is rail, rail wheel bearings. Um, so they, you know, follow rail movement and the bearings wear over time and you don't want to derail them. So that, that's one example. Another one is like drone detection. Drones can be friendly and they can be unfriendly. So you know, we need to understand where drones are and what they're doing. So that's another application. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll be looking beyond um, wind. Um, solar plants don't make much noise. So, <laughs> um, but there are also other applications in wind. So uh, not in Australia, but overseas, there's a lot of issues with ice buildup on blades. So some of our customers said, well, you know, can't you apply your device to listening for ice? So anyway, there's a whole range of applications that we're you know, investigating. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Are there any last questions before I wrap the panel? Uh, sir? Yeah, I'm interested uh, in the EV side of things and the government relationship here, and uh, in particular, the um, tax system. About the petroleum industry contributes between 20 and 25 percent mm -hmm. of federal revenue. True. And it's going to lose that if, uh, I mean, half of the price of a litre of petrol goes straight to Canberra. The government will say that. What, what are you going to do about that bit of it? We've already put together a, yeah. a business model that shows that if yeah. they um, put in their percentages and they use um, uh, our analytics, that they can raise more money and you're still driving a car around half the cost of using a, a high speed or a fossil fuel vehicle. That's not a threat. It's just, you will see so many fossil fuel furfies out in the marketplace to slow down what we're doing. Now, one of them, and you probably wouldn't believe this, but one of them really is powering the, all this talk about, oh, we've got to have high-speed chargers everywhere before we can drive an EV. And the majority of people with EVs, internationally, 90%, charge at home because it's convenient. You know what the cost of energy is. And so really, the majority of people don't need a fast charger. They just need something like our car okay, where you My question in. is about tax. Yes. I, I don't really see the tax. tax the, the government, the tax the government currently rakes in out of the petroleum industry. Yeah, they can do I don't, it with I don't, I don't, I don't, Yeah, well, it's just basically basically your advantage for fuel cost is not as good. It's not as good, but it's still if half. They, if they tax you. Well, if, you, if, if, you, if, if currently if you, you're paying, say, $36 for a 1,000 kilometres in our EV, and you slap a tax, let's put it at 100%, suddenly it's $72 for a 1,000 kilometres. I would doubt by any of you, unless you've got a very, very good car, that you go to the petrol station with $72 worth of fuel in the car and you get your 1,000 kilometres easy. If I'm the treasurer of Australia, I'll say we should be paying just as much as the fossil fuel industry. Well, in that case, it'll so be cheaper. So it might be 500. It won't be, it'll be cheaper. Yeah. It'll be cheaper than that. Oh. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna <laughs> end us off getting into a tax <laughs> debate at the energy event. The, the percentage of tax on fuel is, is not 100%. It's about 100%. It's around, it's about 100, it's just 75 cents odd. Half a litre, half the- About 40%. Half the price of a litre of petrol yeah. is 75 cents. So you add 40% to $36, yeah. and that's your total cost. Yeah. I really don't want to go too far into tax policy. I want to no, no, stick no. with energy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, just wondering about the sort of total cost of ownership for an EV. Obviously, in Australia, you're at a very slow sort of buy, to get involved in buying EVs. and. Uh, People see the depreciation and the cost of replacement batteries as a big barrier, and then those two yeah. things go hand in hand. And yeah. How do you see the total cost of ownership, say, over 10 years? Well, let's take five years, and we've done a comparative with a, a fossil fuel vehicle, pick up for around 16,000, and if you paid for our vehicle, as it sits downstairs now, don't forget to have a look at it downstairs. <laughs> Won't let you drive it around in the foyer, but if you really want to, you can have a little spin around outside, as long as you <laughs> get to the next meeting. But have a look at ours, but uh, now your, your question is relevant, but 16,000 ICE vehicle with all the service work and the other things that happen during its life, you know, brakes and things, uh, 
worked out about the same as our 40,000 people sitting downstairs. Over five over years. Over five years, yeah. So over 10 years, it's better. And of course, you're right, the battery does depreciate or lose condition. So then what, under our scheme anyway, it'll probably be rental or lease, so you don't actually own the battery. Just swap it out, put a new one in, and we repurpose the battery as a home storage or solar farms or whatever else, because the whole battery pack's not there. And most of you probably know that Tesla, because Tesla's running around, done 500,000 K. And um, the battery technology is improving and improving. The thing that kills batteries quickly is rapid charging. It really is. I mean, if you've got a car and you're rapid charging it, you should give it a rest occasionally where it does a slow charge. We can't rapid charge ours at the moment. It's basically like a mobile phone. Plug it in at night, next morning at school, away you go. I'm going to wrap up the panel so that everyone can ask Greg their EV questions directly. Um, I'd like to join me in thanking our panel of uh, Greg, Matt and Kristen for their insights this evening.